Welcome to the Rockbrook Church Podcast. Our hope is that today's message brings you hope and clarity for your spiritual journey. We love hearing how God is working in your life. Feel free to share any stories of how this message gave you a new perspective and hope. Email us at church at rockbrook.org to tell your story. Well, it's really just a reflection of what's happening all the time around here, but we like to take one uh, day, one big day, and uh, have a culminating event where we ask everyone, uh, every single attender of Rockbrook Church, uh, to uh, come and join us in serving our community. It's going to be a great, great a uh, great day. So again, we'd love for you to uh, go to rockbrook.org or go in between uh, the buildings today and check out uh, the tent and, and sign up for a surf project. And uh, it'll be the highlight of your summer. I really do believe uh, that. Today, though, I want to talk to you about something uh, entirely different. Uh, why not everything is going perfectly in your life? Why it's not going the way uh, you want it to go or even the way it should go? And uh, see, you've got problems. You've got trials in your life. And I want to talk about uh, why those exist today. You know, you can become a Christian and still have problems. Yeah. Can I get a better amen? Does anyone want to give a testimony to that? That just because you give your life to Christ doesn't mean you stop having problems. You still have problems in your life. What's fascinating about that is many of those problems and those trials were actually an answer to your prayer, and you didn't even know it. Because you pray, God, I want to know you more. God, I want to be like Christ. Uh, God, I don't want my life to look like the world anymore. I want my family to follow Jesus. I want my finances uh, to be uh, biblical and healthy and godly. I want my job to be fulfilling. And then God lays out the pathway because he says, I want those things for you too. And then he lays out the pathway for that to happen and for those things to grow in your life because that is God's goal for your life. God's number one goal for your life is to make you like his son, Jesus. And so you grow to where your character is strong, your faith is strong. And he's going to do it whether you like it or not. He's a good dad that way. Just like, uh, you know, your kids wake up and they don't always want to go to school, do they? But they go even when the days they don't want to go. Just like a good dad doesn't bail their kids out every time. God's a good dad that way. And he wants to grow us up. And we have all of heaven to be perfectly happy. We have all of heaven to be perfectly fulfilled. This is the training ground. Our time here on earth is the development stage. It's, it's the training ground. And the primary way God y- uses to develop you, the primary way God uses to grow your character to be strong is through testing it. To grow your faith to be strong, the primary thing he does is tests your faith. It's the same thing we do physically. We voluntarily, physically, if we want our body to grow to be strong, we do what? We put it under a testing. We put it under a trial. We, we take it almost to the fail point and break it down so it can be built stronger again. And if you want to grow physically, grow physically strong, not physically flabby, but if you want to grow physically, you have to put your muscles under a test. You have to put them under a trial. You have to put them under resistance. And it's the same way with our faith. If our faith was never met with any resistance, it would never grow. It would never grow to be strong, and our character would never grow. And so we are always under a series of tests, and God uses those tests to build your character, your patience, all kinds of things. The good news about that is that your problems are not pointless. Your problems have a point to them. Your problems are there to test your faith and to grow your faith and to grow you into the man or woman of God that you want to become the man or the woman of God that God wants you to become. Ryland, how do you know all that? 
Like, how can you say that with such confidence that that's how my faith is going to grow? It's because of this verse right here, James 1, 2 through 4. Whenever trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. Oh, I got another problem. So joyful. Wow, what an opportunity. Oh, thank God, another trial. For when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when, you're, for when it is fully developed, you will be strong in character and ready for anything. So tucked inside that financial despair, tucked inside that mean neighbor, that mean coworker, tucked inside uh, that, that issue in your marriage, tucked inside that issue in your family, whatever it is, it's an opportunity for your faith to grow. The problem is that the trials are so stinking hard that sometimes we get so focused on the trial, we lose sight of the opportunity for our faith to grow. The trials, they just, they cloud our vision. They're just, they're too difficult. And many of us end up running away from the very school of character that God wants us to go through. And we run away trying to find more faith anywhere else but the trial. And God says, no, here's where it is. Here's where your character grows. Here's where your faith grows where it is tested. In fact, there's a whole section of the Bible that deals with this specific thing. It's in the book of Hebrews. Uh, the book of Hebrews is in the New Testament. This is after Jesus died and rose from the dead. And uh, the author is not listed for the book. If you read the book of Hebrews, you don't see an author listed. And uh, we don't know who wrote it. We know a, have a handful of people that it could be or that it would be. Um, but we're not entirely sure. Uh, one reason may be because many scholars believe that this book uh, was actually a sermon that was given that someone transcribed. And so when you read it, it kind of reads like a sermon. That may be why I like the book of Hebrews so much, because I like sermons. But if you look through it, uh, you see in chapter 11, the author or the speaker just passionately listing out the people of their heritage and how they live by faith. Because... The people he was writing to or speaking to were considering giving up on their faith. It had just gotten too difficult. And they were seriously considering abandoning Christ and abandoning their faith in Jesus Christ. And so uh, in chapter 11, it just takes them through the, their, their heritage and how they lived by faith. And a few of them I want to look at today. Uh, they're people that you know, characters in the Bible that you know. Uh, but I just want to show you how their faith grew, and it was through a testing. The first guy that we see that was tested is Noah. And Noah, when, when the Bible tells us that when God created the earth, it was perfect. It was Eden. There were no problems. There were no pain. There was no suffering. But man messed it up. And the longer mankind went along, the more messed up it got. That God didn't introduce this evil into the world, that man was the one who started murdering and wars and dishonesty and everything else. And the world got worse and worse to the point where God became grieved that he even started the world. They even started this whole thing. And he said, I'm going to start over. Then it says that the world was so evil that he could only find one man and one family to start over with. And scripture tells us that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so you know about Noah and the flood. After the flood, Noah's sons uh, spread around the world and started different cultures. And we're all from Noah, who came from Adam. Now imagine that you are Noah, or his wife, or one of his kids, and God comes to you, and, and this is an evil place, and God says, I'm going to start over. I'm going to wipe out everything. I'm going to flood the earth. And I need you to build an ark. And I'm going to bring all kinds of animals to you. And we're going to start over. And this is the first test. This is the first test we see in Hebrews 11. If you're taking notes, write this in. What's the test? It's a new task. A new task or a new dream. He's saying, uh, what I'm asking you or what I'm telling you to do, it seems impossible. And this test carries some weight to it. Because you look around and you say, God, you've got 
the wrong guy here. God, you've got the wrong woman. And it leaves you asking a question. It leaves you asking, what? Everybody say, what? what? You've got the wrong guy. Like, you want me to do this task? You want me to go through this? And in verse 7, it says, it was by faith that Noah built an ark to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about something that had never happened before. And up until this time, it had never rained on the earth. That's why they'd never seen a rainbow. The, the earth was uh, watered from condensation. It was, uh, uh, um, that would water the plants and uh, the vegetation life. And it says that up until the flood, life expectancy was very, very long. After the flood, life expectancy starts dropping because something drastically changed in the atmosphere, in the environment. And it says that this had never happened, so it never rained before. And when you have this first test, it's because God will ask you to do something you've never done before. Maybe you've seen other people do it, but you've thought, that, that ain't me. I could never do that. I could never pull that off. And it seems impossible to you. So what is faith when you're going through this test? This is the test. Write this in. What is faith when you're facing a new task? It's facing the future without knowing what? It's facing the future without knowing what it's all going to look like and how it's all going to pan out and that it may not work out the way that you've charted. And Noah went on faith. What is faith? Faith is being sure of what we hope for. So it, it's a hope, but it's become more than a hope. We're sure of it. And certain of what we do not see, of what we do not see. And so we don't, can't see it, can't hold it in our hands, can't touch it, but we're living as though we can. We're living with that type of certainty, that though it's really there. And this is the first test, a new task. What is the second test? The second test is a major change. A major change. You have a major change in your life. The, the current order of things gets upset that you were in uh, your comfort zone. You were doing what you wanted to be doing, where you wanted to be doing it. And all of that gets upset. And it leaves you asking the question, where, Lord? Where are we going this time? Where are you taking me this time, and we're left with the question, where? Now, a great example of this one is the next example in Hebrews. Abraham, verse 8, it says, It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. So Abraham lived in a city called Ur, which was in the Iraq area. And God said, Abraham, I'm going to start with you, and I'm going to start a new thing, and I'm going to make you into a great nation, starting with you. But we're not going to do it here. We're going to do it somewhere else. And so I wanted to set you off on this journey, and I'll let you know when you get there. How would you like that? You're moving, set out on I-70, uh, but you don't know where the landing spot is. You don't know what the exit is. You don't know where you're going to stop, but God's just going to tell you when you get there. Now, this was an especially difficult move. Why? First, because he's 75 years old. 75, that's not really when you want to start the greatest adventure in your life, is it? That's when uh, you want to retire and God says, I'm ready to inspire. At age 75, you want to take it off, hang it up, start playing golf. God says, no, uh, take it back down, put it back on and get ready for the biggest adventure of your life. Here we go. Let's get moving. Now, Abraham had a lot to move because he was a very wealthy guy. He had uh, tons of livestock. He had many employees. This was a big move. This was a big deal. And God was moving him to a new country in the Palestine area. But again, God didn't tell him that up front. He said, I'll let you know when you get there. And this is the second test in life, a major change. And some of you are in the where test because everything's changing. Maybe uh, you've had a job change, or uh, maybe you've recently moved, or uh, your family dynamics are changing, or you're entering into a new season of life. Maybe uh, your school is changing. Maybe you're going away to school. It's a major change, 
and you're not even sure where it's headed. What does faith look like when you're going through a major change? Faith, if you're taking notes, is following God's leading without knowing where. It's following God's leading without knowing where. And Abraham does this. He packs up all his herds and flocks and employees, and he heads off following God. Eventually gets to Canaan, but when he gets to the land, he doesn't even get to settle down. He has to stay in his tent. And God says, you can stop here, but you're still going to be living like you've been living. You're going to stay in your tents. And this is the third test, a delayed promise, a delayed promise. You know, God has thousands of promises for you in the Bible. Thousands. They're guarantees. They're going to happen. However, (laughs) he has not guaranteed to fulfill them all instantly. They aren't vending machine promises. They don't just come when we say we want them. God doesn't work for us. We work for God. And he has made the promises, but he has all of eternity to fulfill them. We're so short-sighted. We think, I need this promise right now. I need you to fulfill this right now. And God says, I have all of eternity to write your story. I have all of eternity to fulfill these promises. And there's a delayed promise. And some of the promises will not be fulfilled this side of heaven. And a delayed promise leaves you asking a big question. It leaves you asking, well, when do I get to graduate? Or when do I get to get married? Or when is this thing going to work out? Or Lord, when are you going to change this person's heart? Or when does this get to not be so difficult in my family anymore? And it leaves you asking the question, when? And you will ask the question, when? You will go through this test many, many times many times in life. You're going to go through the when test several times. Verse 8, it says, even, even after Abraham reached the land, God promised him he lived there by faith. For he was like a foreigner living in a tent. And so did Isaac and Jacob. So there's three generations now of, of nomads that, that even though they were promised Israel, to whom God gave the same promise. Abraham did this because he was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. Now, the word promise is used twice here. God wants you to base your life on promises. What are you basing your life on? Are you basing your life on God's promises? Or are you basing your life on explanations? God wants you to build your life on his promises, not his explanations. And if you ever come to understand that, you will take a giant leap in your faith and a giant leap in your character. God is not going to explain everything. God does not owe us an explanation for everything. And just like for Abraham, where there's this delayed transfer of ownership after he gets the land, lives in tents for three generations, God calls him a stranger in his own country, a foreigner in his own land. And you may be in this test right now. What is faith when you're faced with the when test? Faith is waiting for God's timing without knowing when. Faith is waiting for God's timing without knowing when. And you may be in this test right now. And it's the test of a delayed promise. What's the fourth test? The next test is, uh, uh, goes on with the story of Abraham. It's an unsolvable problem. Now Abraham is 75 years old when God told him uh, that he would start a great nation with him. He moves to the land of Canaan that will become Israel. He's waiting uh, for his wife to become pregnant. And by now, he is age 99 and he doesn't have a son. And now it's physically impossible for he and his wife to have a child. She's a bit younger, but scripture says that Abraham looked at his body and said, no way, Jose. And then Sarah looked at his body and said, double no way. This ain't happening. This isn't going to happen. And it says that they laughed when God said that you're going to have a baby. They thought it was a joke. They laughed. They said, how can we have a baby at this age? But guess what? God had the last 
laugh. But they were left carrying this weight, their faith being tested with this question. And that is, how? How are you going to do this, Lord? How are you going to make this happen? How is this going to work out? It's an unsolvable problem. Verse 11 uh, says, It was by faith that Sarah got together with Abraham, that together with Abraham was able to have a child, even though, I love those two words, even though, I want, I want your life to be marked by so much faith that it's like, well, here was the condition, here was the person, but even though, even they were the ones in the slot, even though they were the ones that God put there, he worked it out, he made it happen. Even though they were too old and Sarah was barren, Abraham believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man, Abraham, who was too old to have any children. A nation with so many people that like stars, like the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore, there is no way to count them. What is faith when you're going through the how test? What is faith when you're facing an unsolvable problem? Faith is expecting a miracle without knowing how. Faith is expecting a miracle even though you can't, human wisdom can't work it out, even though you can't solve all of the problems. It's trusting God. And that is the test of your faith. Moving on with Abraham is the the fifth test. And it seems irrational. It seems illogical. This was the ultimate test in Abraham's life. And guess what? This will be the ultimate test in your life too. It's the fifth test. It's a senseless loss. A senseless loss. A senseless loss will be the ultimate test in your life. Because the fact is, folks, so much of life just doesn't make sense. It's a weight that we have to carry. And it leaves us asking maybe the hardest question of all as it's the ultimate test. And that is, why? God, why would you set me out on this journey to begin with? God, why would you design it that way? God, why would you make it that way? God, why would you create it that way? God, why, why would you uh, let me or allow me to have to, to go through this trial to begin with? And so much of what happens in life just does not make sense. And when we look for an explanation, we often are not going to find one. A lot in life does not get explained to us. And we spend our entire lives thinking, if I could just get an explanation, I'd be able to handle the loss. If I could just get an explanation from God, I could take it. I could work with that. I, I could have more faith in Him. But the fact is, you won't. Explanations never comfort. And what you need when you are in pain and have had a major loss is you need the presence of God, not an explanation of God. We see that after Abraham had this miracle baby named Isaac, one day God uh, presented the ultimate test of his life. And it, it didn't make sense. And And he didn't get a great explanation for it. But he said, I want you to sacrifice your son to me. It seems brutal. It seems nonsensical. That why would God ask for Abraham to sacrifice the son that God gave in a miracle? And God is not a mean God. And Abraham knew that. So he's going to obey knowing that God would do something about it. He'd been walking with God long enough by now to know that God had a reason. But this was the ultimate test. Isaac represented everything God had promised to Abraham. With no Isaac, there's no future generation. There's no, or with him, the future generation is lost and therefore the nation is lost. The the promise is lost. There's so many dynamics and layers to this that if Isaac has lost everything that God had been working out and working together for good, is lost. And in verse 17, it says, It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son Isaac, even though God had promised him. Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. 
And this is the one of, of the most gripping stories in scripture of how God will find a way. And this will be the most gut-wrenching test of your life when God says, that person I'm giving you or that dream I've given you, you've got to give it up. You've got to sacrifice it. Because if you love the dream more than you love God, the dream has become an idol. And again, there are so many layers to this story, but at the last second, God stops Abraham and he provides a lamb to be sacrificed. A few thousand years later, God would offer the lamb of God to be sacrificed, his son for you. And for those who trust him, for those who put their faith in him, He provides a lamb. He provides a way out where there seemed to be no way. And Abraham passed the test. Verse 19 says, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Some of you are dealing with a senseless loss right now. What is faith? What does faith look like for you when you're dealing with a a senseless loss? Faith is trusting God's purpose without knowing why. Faith is trusting God's purpose without knowing why. If you can explain, if you can answer the question why to everything in your life, you're not living by faith. If you can explain everything in your life, you're not living by faith. Some things are not explainable. Let me give you the last test. This is the sixth test. That is prolonged pain. It could be a chronic pain in your life. It could be a a physical pain that you have to live with every day. Maybe it's an emotional pain or a mental pain. Maybe it's a pain that it's a weight that you carry. You wake up and you carry it every day of your life. And you're left asking the question, why? But after a little while, you're left asking the question, how long? How long do I have to go through this? How long do I have to carry this pain? How long do I have to suffer through this? And many prophets in the Bible ask, how long, Lord? A good example of this is another person in Hebrews 11, Moses. Moses had incredible persistence and put up with enormous pain. His life is divided into uh, three phases. He had 40 years in Pharaoh's court learning to be uh, a somebody. He had 40 years in the desert as a nobody. And he had 40 years leading a million people through the wilderness. And he had every right to say, he faced criticism and conflict and misunderstanding and pain. He had every right to say, how long, Lord? And he gave up everything. Moses gave up everything that we spend our entire life trying to achieve. Salary, status, sex, pleasure, position, all of it. He gave it all up. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter, the grandson of the most powerful man in the world, and he chose to give it up. Give it up. Look at it with me in verse 24. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. He did not base his decisions. What he made a choice And it went against what he was feeling. It went against what he wanted on the inside. Now, our culture today says, base everything on your feelings, that truth is found inside yourself. And that if you feel it, that it could be part of truth. But not everything that feels wrong is bad. And not everything that feels good is right. Your feelings lie to you all the time. Your feelings will lie to you more than anyone else or anything else. It'll tell you that uh, things are better than they actually are. Your feelings will tell you that things are worse than they actually are. We, we get manipulated by our moods. The truth is, there's lots of things to stay faithful. You're not going to feel it. I don't always feel like being nice to people. I don't always feel like preaching. You don't always feel like listening to it. In fact, bye, 
Like, just, if we're going off feeling, let's just stop right now. There's many things to be faithful. You're not going to feel it. I don't always feel like reading my Bible, but I know it helps. I don't always feel like praying, but I know that's the time I need to pray the most. I don't always feel like encouraging people who are are down or losing uh, the faith. Uh, So what? So what? I don't feel it. This passage in Hebrews 11, it's called the Hall of Fame of Faith. It's the, it's the greatest of, the, of faith. And you look through, and those men and those women did not always feel it. They didn't always feel like trusting God. They didn't always feel like staying faithful. Thank God you don't have to feel it to be faithful. Because there's going to be many times you don't feel it. But thank God faith is not only a feeling. Faith is, what is faith when you're asking the question, how long? Faith is continuing to persist without knowing how long. How do you keep doing the right thing when you don't feel it? How do you go to work when you don't feel it? How do you handle prolonged pain? Faith is continuing to persist when you don't know how long. Verse 27 says, By faith, Moses left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. He had his eyes fixed on someone, Jesus Christ, whose life, hello, made no sense at the time. You can read through Jesus' life and ask these six questions over and over and over again. It didn't make sense that uh, the Son of God, to start his ministry uh, to people for the glory of God, would have to start in the wilderness for 40 days, starving, being tempted by the devil. It made no sense that his family would misunderstand him, not know what he was doing. It made no sense that his followers would drop off one by one. It didn't seem right that the Pharisees could just get away with lying about him and the Sadducees could conspire against him. It didn't seem right that Judas was allowed to betray him. I mean, it seemed absurd that God would stand silent as Jesus is handed over from Pilate to the crowd and they choose to free Barabbas. It didn't make sense. It it seemed to take forever as they whipped him within an inch of his life. It was hard to understand when he was hammered to the cross and all the forces of evil came against him. It didn't seem right that a man who'd lived a perfect life, never done anything wrong, had to take on the shame and the guilt on his mind and his spirit of everything that had ever been done wrong. And it didn't make sense that God would forsake him in Jesus' moment of need. And as they went to bury him, it didn't seem like God was doing the right thing. But Jesus got up out of that grave and received his reward. And guess what? So can you. And so will you if you will persevere. And if you'll run your race to the end. Verse 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. And that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Which test are you facing right now? Which of these questions are you asking? There's nothing wrong with asking these questions. The key is, will you trust God without knowing what, without knowing where and when, how, why, and how long? These are the questions that grow your faith. These are the trials. These are the resistance that grow your character. Now, I I don't know uh, many people in our church who could lift this weight, who could bench this. Some people could, but I don't know many who could. And if you are under the impression that this sermon was building up to a moment of me lifting this, uh, you are really mistaken, okay? (laughs) I'm with Kyle, our drummer this weekend, who said the most exercise I get is moving exercise equipment around. So that's, you know, kind of the camp I fall into. But while I don't know many people who could lift this physically, I know many people in our church who could lift what this represents. Their faith has been tested. Their their faith has come under some resistance. They've hit some trials and they've persevered. And the same thing that was said for Moses could be said to them, about them, that they persevered because they saw what was invisible. They fixed their eyes on what they could not see, Jesus Christ. And I want it to be true of me 
that have persevered. I persevered through these tests, through these questions. And the character has grown strong and that I'm ready for anything. Don't you want that to be true of you? Don't you want to make it to the end and receive your reward and have your faith refined in the fire, but it has come out gold? Let's pray together. Dear God, I want to be a person of faith, a person of character who you can use in a mighty way. Dear Jesus, help me face the future in faith without knowing what. Help me follow your leading without knowing where. Help me wait for your timing without knowing when. Help me to expect a miracle without knowing how. And help me to trust your plan and purpose without knowing why. Help me to continue to persist and endure without knowing how long. And if you don't have anything or anyone to look forward to, if you don't have a reason to persist or a reason to persevere, I just invite you in these next moments to open your life up to Christ and say, Jesus Christ, come into my life right now. Be the Savior that I need right now. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We would love for you to get connected to what's going on at Rockbrook Church. Visit us online at rockbrook.org for service times, small group information, and other ways you can discover your purpose here on earth.